Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. And our little attendee list counter is zooming, skyrocketing. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO of the CFEDS Association of America. We're just uh, activating the webcasting software, and we will um, just wait a couple more seconds as um, people enter the, our virtual room. And get hey, Kim, what, um, what kind of audio are you on? I'm on the telephone. Hmm. Can you hear me? Can hear you, but you um, you vibrate. Hmm. I'm on a regular handset. Okay. I mean, it's not bad, but um, it it just sounds like it breaks up and comes back in really quickly. Does Does mine sound okay? Yours sounds great, and. Um, Kim Allman just stuck her head in and said it sounds fine when it's coming through on their end. Okay. So. Welcome, everyone. If you're just joining us, this is Kim McCleary in Charlotte, North Carolina at the CFIDS Association of America. We're just um, waiting a couple more seconds. It's now, I think, right at 2 o'clock uh, on the East Coast, and I know we have Folks joining us from the UK and uh, somebody else who had said they were going to join us from New Zealand and the West Coast and parts all around and in between. So we'll just um, wait one more second here and then get started. Um, if you haven't participated in one of these go-to webinar uh, meetings before, just take a second to get used to the way the screen looks. Um, you should have a small control panel on the right side of your screen, which is where you type in questions that, um, unfortunately, the way it's set up, only I can see, but um, I'll be keeping track of those during the program as Suzanne is presenting her slide deck, and then we will have time for questions at the end. Um, we'll also launch some polls to just sort of gauge um, both the pace and the information level, and um, you'll be able to give us some feedback as we go along. So, um, Suzanne, you ready to get started? We're ready. Okay. Um, again, welcome. This is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO of the CFIDS Association. Um, I've been with the association for 19 years now, so have quite a bit of uh, institutional and community uh, memory. Um, of all the events of almost two decades. Um, and it's my pleasure to host this webinar, the second of our series for 2010, um, with my colleague, Dr. Suzanne Vernon, who is our scientific director and has served in that position for two years. Um, prior to that, she was uh, a researcher at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for 17 years. Um, she was in the CFS research group for uh, 10 years of that time and is a trained virologist um, with a PhD in particular emphasis in systems biology. So um, she has what I think is a rather unique ability to synthesize all the body's systems and put them into that systems view that is um, really very important in a condition in a disease like CFS where so many different body systems are affected and we don't know yet enough um, about the pathogenesis or pathophysiology of CFS to be able to just hone in on one organ system or one tissue sample or any of those things. So we have to be very um, cross-disciplinary in our viewpoint still. Um, and I think that's what one of Suzanne's strengths is in not only being able to understand all those functions, but almost better yet, being able to translate those into things that uh, people who don't have a PhD after their name can also understand. So we're delighted to have you with us this afternoon. We had, uh, as of a few minutes ago, about 472 registrants for the program today, and I see about 200 have so far joined us. Um, 
again, if you're new to webinar software, orient yourself with the uh, control panel that you have on the side, right side of your screen, I believe. Um, and that's how you ask questions of Dr. Vernon. And um, know that there is a bit of a time delay as she advances her slides before you see them. And we're trying to take that into account in the pace of the program. But if your screen isn't looking like exactly what she's talking uh, about, give it a few seconds and it should settle in just fine. And then um, just the last sort of uh, housekeeping point is if you have questions, send them as you think of them rather than waiting until the end. And um, it's kind of my job is to, to uh, classify the questions and then at the end to um, ask Suzanne the ones that have come in most frequently or the ones that are most uh, specific to this particular topic, which is the association's research program. So with that, I am going to attempt to transfer the slide uh, control over to Suzanne, and we'll allow her to get started. Okay, here it comes, Suzanne. Do I have to do anything? <coughs> see that um, waiting room again as we transfer control. should come to you. Are you getting the transfer screen? Yep, got it. Can you see my slide? There you go. Looks like you need to make it full screen. Yep. It's a little bit slow. Let's see. There we go. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today in our first of our 2010 webinar series. We hope to be no, second. actually our second. second. Our second, yes. Cindy, Cindy was had the honor of being our first, opening up the year, and I'm second, and hopefully we're going to have a, a number of uh, additional exciting webinars for um, you to participate in. Today, what we wanted to do was to give you an update on our CFIDS Association Research Program, provide a little bit of the, the rationale for why we decided to um, go full force in supporting research, give you a little bit of background, and also an update on where the research is that we are supporting. It's important for um, us to help you understand the, the kind of research that we are supporting and how we think it's going to really accelerate the pace of which we can um, identify more objective or objective diagnostic markers and um, improved treatments for CFS. So without further ado, let's get started. I, many of you have probably seen this picture on the right before. I think it, it does a really good job of capturing um, what we've been able to describe um, for CFS over the past 20 years or so. We know some of the risk factors for CFS, such as various types of infections, various types of stress, various types of genetic markers and environmental influences, and how those can interact to trigger uh, CFS. We also have, know a lot about the various types of signs and symptoms that are associated with CFS. Many studies have shown that CFS is a very heterogeneous disease, really not just one type of disease, but perhaps several different subtypes. Many investigators have looked at and characterized the pathways in CFS and some of the biology. For example, if you look at this figure, can you see my cursor moving, Kim? Yes. Okay. Um, if you look at this figure, you see that there's been a lot of research characterizing neuroendocrine pathways, sympathetic nervous system pathways, immune pathways, et cetera. 
But yet what we don't know and we don't have are objective ways to use this information in order to be able to diagnose CFS without um, the help of self-report questionnaires and, and a diagnosis based just on signs and symptoms. And we also do not have the ability yet to use this information in order to be able to effectively treat CFS. Further, we do not yet have biomarkers. Now, what are biomarkers? Biomarkers are indicators. It's biological markers. And these biomarkers can be indicators at any stage along the spectrum of CFS, from health to sickness, from for diagnosis, for treatment. A biomarker is any kind of indicator that can be used to help us further understand, diagnose, and treat CFS. With that in mind, we, when we decided to become a full-blown research support organization, we asked ourselves, where do we target? Where do we look for biomarkers when it comes to trying to, to improve our understanding and our ability to deal with CFS? We struggled or we debated amongst ourselves, our, our board and our staff, as far as do we, should we have a very directed research program? In other words, should we study the central nervous system, should we study the or support research that studies the immune system, the autonomic nervous system, or should we go very broad? And after several months, actually, of debating this, we decided that the best approach now, at this point in time with CFS, was to have a broad um, funding opportunity. And I put this there in quotes for you to read. This was our actual solicitation, and we called for research proposals that will advance the discovery of biomarkers and methods that could aid in the early detection, objective diagnosis, and effective treatment of CFS. We felt that this was our ability or our opportunity to really do a research investment evaluation. In other words, let's try to get an idea of where the targets are. Where is the most rich evidence or the best evidence for biomarkers so that we can essentially truncate the, the, the pipeline, as you will, the research pipeline from discovery to actual implementation or use of a biomarker for diagnosis and treatment. And if we have a directed funding opportunity in the future, it will be where the biomarker science, for example, again, if it's immune system or if it's pathogens, has adv advanced enough so that we can essentially de-risk biomarkers for CFS research. And what I mean by de-risking is we make those biomarkers much more attractive for industry to take a further look at, to bring to the next stage of validation and implementation. We de-risk that for investigators um, in, in academic or in private sector in order for them to get further funding for those types of biomarkers to advance where we're at. Again, our idea is to accelerate the process take it down from 15 or 20 years, which is usual for a biomarker, to much less than that. Page down. My, my uh, screen is froze, Kim. Oh, there we go. OK, so what I'd like to do now is tell you a little bit about 
each of the six research projects that we awarded funding to, research investigators and research projects that were awarded funding. Back up a little bit, in 2008, after we issued our, um, our announcement, our funding, funding announcement, we received 24 full applications that went through a very rigorous peer review process and they were analyzed for scientific, or they were reviewed for scientific merit and strategic merit. Did they meet the criteria, the scientific criteria that had been outlined in the RFA and the funding opportunity, and did, did they meet our strategic merit for really kind of bridging that gap between basic research and the, and the, and the applied research? Of those 24, we funded six that scored, that were highly, highly competitive and scored very well. And so here's a little bit of background on each one of these. Um, this is Dr. Kathy Light from the University of Utah Health Sciences Center. Her um, uh, project is called Novel Ion Channel-Based Biomarkers in CFS. Dr. Light works with her husband, Alan Light, also at the university, and Dr. Cindy Bateman on this particular project. What they are doing is they are looking at markers on blood cells. And this is a nice little animated picture of what these ion channel receptors look like and what they do. As you see up here, we have some sodium ions. And this is actually not a blood cell. This is actually a nerve cell, this yellow um, kind of snaky looking thing. And these are the receptors on the nerve cell. They originally characterized these receptors in a mouse model when they were studying pain and fatigue markers in mice. Alan Light is a neuroscientist, and so this is what he was interested in. And he found that these markers were responsive to these types of molecules or, or chemicals, the sodium and the ATP, which was an indicator that they were responsive to energy or the lack thereof. And you can see that these lactate, the lactate provides protons, which then bind to the various receptors and allows ATP to also bind. These, these chemicals and receptors then act as a complex to allow sodium in, which then initiates the energy or the electrical signal that then goes up to the brain saying, activate. And this is what initiates this, this signal up to the brain. Now again, these, this signal is shown here on nerve cells, and what they are actually studying are the same types of receptors on blood cells. They don't know if the, these receptors on the blood cells behave the same way as they do on the nerve cells. And essentially what they're doing now is using these blood cell ion channel receptors as an indicator of that fatigue and pain signal that you just show, saw on the previous slide. So let's go through this again. These receptors are activated by lactic acid and ATP. Again, important chemicals for energy. Those signals, the, the lactic acid and the ATP, go through the sensory nerve endings, through those receptors, enter into the bloodstream. Also, that signal goes up to the brain and, this, and then comes back down through these afferent channels, releasing additional indicators, these adrenergic receptors, which also then send signal into the blood cell. Oh, and that just exploded on us. And the those same signals then cause an upregulation of those receptors on the blood cells. And that's what they're measuring. 
those receptors on the blood cell molecules. The model that they're using to study the expression of these receptors is an exercise challenge model. They use this airdyne bicycle, shown here on the left, where you actually get your arm movement and your leg movement to get the heart pumping, blood flowing, oxygen working. And they do a moderate exercise versus a maximal exercise. They are studying CFS patients, MS patients, and this is their disease control group, and also healthy controls. They have 50 subjects in each group. They take a blood sample before the individual starts exercising, and then four times after the exercise. That blood is then processed so that it can be examined for those markers, those ion channel receptors. Since the XMRV um, finding, they are now working with Ila Singh, who is a pathologist at the University of Utah and one of the original discoverers of XMRV and prostate cancer, to look for uh, XMRV in these same subjects. And we should be hearing about that work over the coming months. But right now, what we have are results on those various ion channel receptors. And these, these receptors fall into these types of groups. Remember the sensory, the ones that actually detect those ATP molecules and sodium molecules, the adrenergic ones, those are, those are the receptors that are responsive to the signal as it comes back down from the brain and then also immune signals. This is what these various receptors look like in healthy controls. Baseline, this is before a blood sample taken before exercise, 30 minutes after exercise, 8 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. Not very much. This is about 25 minutes of exercise at 70% um, effort, heart rate, of maximal heart rate, not much activity. When the same procedure is done for CFS patients, and these patients, um, these are subjects that have um, only CFS or CFS and fibromyalgia, we see an incredible difference in the activity of these of these markers. I'm trying to find my, here we go. I'm going to take that away for a sec. So at baseline, there is no expression of these markers. 30 minutes later, almost all of the sensory, adrenergic, and immune markers are upregulated. And then they stay upregulated for up to 48 hours afterwards. I mean, this is, this is quite remarkable. This, is, this was um, a very surprising finding for how rapidly these markers on the blood cells became upregulated and was a very strong indicator to them that these could be markers of fatigue. Because at, right about at this point where the post-exertional malaise symptom sets in. Now, I want to show you the disease control group, the MS. MS patients also experience fatigue, but they do not experience post-exertion fatigue. And here you see that they are very much like the healthy controls, very little expression, except for this one odd um, uh, response right here at 24 hours. This was just the beginning of their work. I think in this, in this particular slide, we're looking at about um, 20 CFS patients. They have now t finished testing all 50 from each subgroup. And we should be hearing the, um, the final uh, analysis, hearing about, reading about the final analysis from this work 
um, hopefully within the next year. But this is very exciting and a very promising biomarker for CFS. Our next researcher is Gordon Broderick, and Gordon is at the University of Alberta. And his project is called Molecular Patterns of Persistent Immune Activation in a Post-Infectious Adolescent Cohort. Gordon is collaborating with Renee Taylor at the University of Chicago, Ben Katz at Northwestern, Saul Lafrani, who's at the Wiseman Institute in Israel, and Carl Schaefer, who's at the um, National Center for uh, Information Technology at, N at NIH. Suzanne, before you go on, can I launch a couple polls to make sure we're doing OK speed-wise? Sure. OK. Um, hopefully, everybody will see in a second a poll about the pace of the presentation. If you could just indicate back to us whether it's too fast, too slow, or just about right, that will help as we continue through the rest of the slides. And as soon as we get to 80 percent, I will close the poll and everybody will see what the results are. OK, looks like uh, just about right. Suzanne, 84 percent feel like you're going just about right, 14% too slow, and 1% too fast. Uh, I'm going to do one more. Um, OK. I'll take so I'll break. stay the same then. Yeah, stay the same. And then let us know whether this is too technical, too oversimplified, or just about right. Is that another poll question? Yep. Voted, so I'll close it up. And again, just about right. Um, okay. I just looked at the time. I might speed it up a little bit. Okay. Since we have five more, um, five more projects to go through. Can I go on? Mm, you can go. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Gordon's project. Okay. So as I indicated, Gordon is um, studying the immune response, the immune system, immune signals in a post-infectious um, uh, model. And these are adolescents who had documented episode of acute infectious mononucleosis, that's kissing disease caused by Epstein-Barr virus. And the, there were 10 individuals and children who did not recover and developed CFS um, and are still sick with CFS, in addition to 10 matched controls. He's looking at the blood, examining various things in the blood, including cytokines and gene expression. Okay. Gordon is a chemical engineer by training, and he's now in the medical school at the University of Alberta. So he is taking a mathematical and a computational biology approach to using his engineering skills to try to put together the various signals that they measure in the blood um, using some pretty darn sophisticated mathematical techniques. This is just an example of a formula, which I wouldn't have a clue how to explain to you. But with that formula, he is able to then generate these various types of networks. And this is a network showing, um, an, an idealized network showing how various immune genes communicate along with other types of signals, including hormone signals and cytokine signals. These, these arrows indicate kind of the direction of the communication, whether it be two-way versus one-way. So how these various molecules influence each other and, and, and essentially talk to each other. When he applies these types of 
of techniques to actual data. This is what he comes up with. And many of you may have seen this, this slide before. This is a publication that he had last year comparing healthy controls in this A panel to people with CFS, combining a number of different types of cytokine measures with gene expression to show how these molecules communicate with each other. So let's just take a look at what's going on here in the healthy controls. You can see that it's a it's a interesting looking network of communication and think of this as what should happen in an individual. These are our healthy controls. If you then compare that to what is going on in the CFS subjects, it's quite different. We have this very condensed network here of cytokines. This type of pattern is an indication of some type of chronic inflammatory response going on. He can further add a number of different types of hormones and additional genes that were measured and clearly separate. And now I'm looking at this little inset box over here in the bottom left-hand corner. He can separate CFS subjects, shown as all of the black dots, from healthy controls. So I think you can see how this particular approach combining a number of different types of measures, immune gene expression, cytokines, and hormones, has the potential to, to objectively classify or differentiate people with CFS from, from healthy controls and potentially identify areas, going back over here to this network, where you can target various types of interventions in order to be able to stop or inhibit this inflammatory network that has communication network that has formed. So a very powerful, very high resolution approach that gives us a lot of information for diagnosis and potential intervention targets. Suzanne, can you just uh, give a quick description of what a cytokine is? OK, so a cytokine, well, there's a bunch of different cytokines. In this particular, in this, in this diagram, we're looking at a lot of interleukins. But cytokines are, are signals. They are, they are chemicals that are produced by immune cells. And they're, they're sent out from immune cells in order to talk to other immune cells and tell them how to behave. Do you now mount an immune response against an invading pathogen? Those are the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Or do you now turn down the, the immune response or the inflammation to a certain event, such as a pathogen or an infection? Those are called the anti-inflammatory cytokines. There's a number of different types of, of cytokines in addition to those. But to just think of them as immune signals and trying to tell cells how to behave. Does that make sense? Is that, was that so. OK, Kim? Yep, yep, I think so. One of the questions. OK, um, I just wanted to show you uh, this, this graph. Each one has, has um, OK, so we have about 15 patients or um, individuals, 15 to 20 individuals on the right. And this is time on the x-axis from zero months, from, from the time they were infected at zero, six months post-infection, 12, 18, 24. And on the y-axis is the actual fatigue score. And these are what the individuals reported following their bout with mono. And what we see is that there are three different types of patterns in these patients. The, the darker blue line are the subjects who did not recover. They developed CFS. The lighter blue line are individuals that actually recovered early. 
and the yellow are subjects that recovered late. This is an interesting way to think about other approaches that we can begin to use to, to help predict or determine who is going to develop CFS following a certain event such as um, mono or recover. And this is the kind of information that, that Gordon will use in addition to some of his molecular markers to, to help us determine what are the most promising predictive markers for staying sick following something like mono. So this is a, a, an example of information integration. A lot, a lot of different types of, of information in order to be able to identify effective biomarkers. Our next project I is by Paul, Suzanne. Yeah. There seems to be a couple people saying they can't hear. So let's see how wide that problem is. Can't hear me. Can't hear you. Like you might want to speak up just a bit. It's about okay. uh, three to one as far as people being able to hear. Okay. Um, can you take another one to see if that's better? No, it'll only do it once. <laughs> oh, okay. So if you're still having a hard time, maybe you could turn up your speakers on your or turn up your phone volume, and um, Suzanne will do her best to speak a little loud, more loudly. And that's very unusual for, for me. <laughs> People usually hear me loud and clear. Um, OK, now hopefully I'm not too loud now. Our next project is um, being spearheaded by Marvin Meadow. Marvin is at New York Medical College. And he's working with his collaborators, Ben Nadelson, who's at Beth Israel in Manhattan, and Julian Stewart who's also at New York Medical College. And their study is looking at splanchnic vasoconstriction um, in CFS and whether or not that vasoconstriction um, reduces blood flow to the brain. So if you're like me, you're going to ask, what the heck is splanchnic vasoconstriction? Splanchnic basically means gut. So they're looking at pooling of blood in the gut and why that happens more frequently in people with CFS. Close my little bar on the right here. <clears throat> now, Marvin uses a number of very sophisticated methods to study blood physiology. And they're looking at. Um, CFS patients between the ages of 15 and 39, they are going to study about, or they are studying 15 CFS patients, 15 CFS patients that also have POTS, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and 15 healthy controls. They take a number of cardiovascular measurements, including heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory volume and rate, and end tidal CO2. They look at impedance measurements, and that basically means the change in distribution of body fluids. They also look at blood vessel responsiveness. Oh, I have lots of typos on this slide. Sorry about that. Using laser flow um, Doppler. And that essentially looks at the, the, the skin, the, the, the very superficial blood vessels response to heat and drugs. And then finally, they're looking at brain blood flow using a trans transcranial, transcranial Doppler. And these are shown, some of these are shown over here in these pictures. So some of you may be familiar with the tilt table. This, this gentleman is laying supine on his back on a tilt table. You can see that he has a number of different things hooked up to his body. Here's something that looks like it's going in, you know, attached to his skin, blood pressure cuffs on his arm and on his leg, 
oxygen measurements on his finger, something around his head, which is this transcranial Doppler right here. This, this probe actually measures the, um, the, the arterial pressure in that artery that's right underneath that probe. This is what happens when the tilt table is put upright to a 70% um, upright position. And again, still everything attached so, so that they can assess what happens when the body then becomes upright. Does the blood that's probably equally distributed now in this lying down position, <clears throat> does the blood and the heart pump the blood up to the brain once the person is put upright? And this lower, posi and this lower picture shows um, this how they how they measure blood vessel responsiveness to various types of chemicals or heat or temperature. This diagram shows that a little wire that's inserted under the skin, and then the laser Doppler is laid on top of that, so that they can then measure that Doppler listens or responds to the various. Um, signals that are sent through this probe that's underneath the skin based on what's happening in, the, um, in these superficial capillary beds, in these, in these small blood vessels right under the skin. So a lot of different types of measurements going on in this study. And let me show you the results of some of those. Okay, This fir first one looks at heart rate, respiration, and, and, and the end tidal CO2, and control, healthy control to the top. And these squiggly lines are just electrical signals that they are recording. The red line here is um, when somebody's laying down before. As soon as this, we hit this red line, they're tilted up. They, they remain tilted up this point in time when they go back down to their back again. So those red lines are, are up and then down, tilted up and tilted down. And this is what an, a, a healthy person's response would be to that tilt. On this lower panel, you see what happens in a person with CFS. Heart rate goes up upon tilt and then upon putting back down again, the heart rate goes back down. Respirations go up and somewhat erratic when the person is tilted up versus when they come back down. And end tidal CO2 goes down in people with CFS. Clearly very different from the healthy control in these particular patterns. This is blood volume measurement. Now remember, they're studying blood flow. They want to see whether or not the, the blood is pooling in the gut area. And what you can see is that in the thorax, so the, the white bars are controls, and the ha red hatched bars are those with CFS, and POTS, again, POTS being postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And there's a difference in the blood pooling in the thorax with a, with a greater percent change in those with CFS. Much uh, a significant amount of pooling in the gut in people with CFS, and not much change in the pelvic and the leg area in, this, in people with CFS. This particular graph that just popped up is um, the, the, what happens under the, the superficial blood, um, blood vessels in people with POTS, and that's the red line here, versus the healthy controls. Again, a huge difference in the response to things like um, temperature and chemicals that are put through that little capillary that's put underneath the skin and then probed with the Doppler. So even the very superficial, very tiny blood vessels under the skin are different in people with CFS compared to those 
health controls. And finally, this is the transcranial Doppler measurement that they're taking. And this just shows a picture of where that probe is placed right here to get that, that major artery um, reading to see how effectively the brain, the brain gets the blood from the periphery. These arrows indicate a tilt again. So this is when the people are laying down, tilted up. The grade area is, um, or the grade line is CFS POTS, and the black is control. And this is the mean arterial pressure. So the arterial pressure in people with CFS POTS is much less and more erratic. You can see this line is a, it, much higher peaks and valleys than in the healthy controls. And also blood flow, much less and more erratic in CFS POTS compared to healthy controls during tilt. So from this study, we are getting clear measures, clear indicators of differences in blood flow physiology in people with CFS compared to healthy controls. Again, another nice set of potential biomarkers for us to, to really seriously kind of consider and, and um, take to the next level as, as additional evidence mounts. Tacoma Shanggu is at the Wheel, Medical, Wheel Cornell Medical College, and that's of Cornell University. But Wheel Cornell is, is located in Manhattan. Tacoma is a physicist who is using magnetic resonance neuroimaging to look at brain metabolism and also blood flow in people with CFS. He collaborates with Sanjay Matthew, who is at MD Anderson uh, Medical Center in Texas, and also Ben Nadelson in Manhattan and Beth Israel. The approach that Ducoma and his team are using is imaging. This is a this this picture shows a typical they call it a tube, but this is a, a a giant magnet where the person goes into this channel and then has the image or a picture taken of their brain. The particular approach that that Decoma uses is called proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy imaging. And this is a standard imaging approach, except that it's looking at the metabolites, the various types of chemicals and amino acids, and how the brain is using them. This is completely non-invasive. And it's very informative to tell us what, what kind of activity our brain is having in a chemical way. They're looking at a number of different metabolites and comparing people with CFS to people that have major depressive disorder and general anxiety disorder. disorder. And again, these are important groups. These, these are disease control groups. And they're comparing to healthy volunteers. So CFS, MDD, GAD, and healthy, comparing all of those. They take a number of different types of clinical measurements. They correlate these um, metabolic measures that they get from the MRSI to the various types of clinical and demographic information that they, that they collect. And they also are able to map these regional um, these metabolites to various parts of the brain. This is just another signal diagram of what kind of output Decoma gets when he, when he does an MRSI. It's non-invasive because everything is related to water. Okay? The, the, magnet, the magnet basically detects the hydrogen molecule in water and then relates that to the number of hydrogens 
that are in these other metabolites in the brain. And this is the spectrum or the signal that they get, and then they compare this profile, this signal profile, to the various subjects. Here is where they map those metabolites to the brain. And this red hatched area is a space. It's called the ventricular space. And what this team found was that lactate, this molecule right here, was increased in the ventricular spaces of the brains in people with CFS. And that's shown here. Each yellow diamond represents a CFS patient. And the lactate um, amount or level in the, in the brain, and this is the liquid space in the brain, compared to those with general anxiety disorder and healthy volunteers. Clearly a different, a significant and different level of lactate in individuals with CFS. They are, are about finished now testing the um, major depressive disorder group and comparing the levels of lactate in that disease control group in addition to a number of the other metabolites that in order to try to get an idea of whether or not people with CFS and the brains in people with CFS are um, undergoing more oxidative stress than um, the disease control groups and healthy controls. And we should be hearing about those results in the next couple of months. How this is, this is a model of how Tacoma and his team have tried to explain this elevated lactate in the brain of people with CFS. How do you get there? Well, if we go up to this left-hand corner, we see that they hypothesize that there are a number of different ways to cause the brain to have increased lactate. Various types of triggers, including um, bacteria or viral infection or immune dysfunction, um, inflammation will cause an, uh, a reactive oxidative stress state. So a lot of oxygen, bad oxygen molecules cause the mitochondria to um, react differently and potentially dysfunction, making, oops, sorry, making the brain um, use a different type of way to produce energy. This is called an anaerobic energy state versus an aerobic energy state. And this would result in increased lactate in the brain. Further, this, this oxidative state, the reactive oxidative state, produces these, these bad chemicals in the blood, which causes the blood vessels to constrict, and therefore reducing the flow of blood to the brain, also resulting in this increased lactate in the brain. This is the model that they are testing. So not only are they taking measurements of what's happening in the brain, but they're also looking at some of these chemicals in the blood. They're also assessing some of the chemicals that are specific to mitochondria. And what's really cool is Dacoma is working with Marvin and Julian to, on the same patients to determine whether or not those that, that Marvin and Julian find have um, various types of blood physiology abnormalities also have these, these central nervous system abnormalities. So this is a real good example of um, incorporating or integrating various types of information from a number of different types of, of um, disciplines in order to be able to identify effective biomarkers, again, that we can use to help diagnose and treat CFS. Sanjay Shukla is from Marshfield Clinic Research Foundation, and this is in Marshfield, Wisconsin. 
Um, and he is working with Dane Cook, who's at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Dan Frank, who's at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and Steve Yale, who's also at the Marshfield Clinic. <clears throat> and they are looking, they're taking a metagenomics approach to study CFS. Well, what is a metagenomics approach? Metagenome basically means they are looking at cataloging the, the thousands of genomes, and these are microbial genomes, that occur in people with CFS and comparing those to um, healthy controls. This top panel picture shows um, a, a, a microscopic picture of the, kind of the, the types of bacteria that you would see if you were to sample different parts of our body and then look at them under a microscope slide. See round ones, oblong ones, very filamentous ones, et cetera. We now know that there are at least 10 times more microbial cells on our body and in our body than our own cells. And this picture below shows um, this, is, this is actually a tree more like a bush of all the different types of microbes that have been mapped to date, thousands of different microbes. So I think you can think of our bodies as microbial bags more so than, than anything else. Sorry about that. I'm jumping ahead. <clears throat> Their purpose is to determine whether or not the, the microbes in the gut, in the intestine, and this is known as a microbiota because they're normal. We're supposed to have microbes in our intestine. Whether or not in CFS patients, these microbes are altered. Is there an alter commun altered microbial community compared to normal healthy controls? And they're also trying to, to determine whether or not there's an, a different type of movement of this microbiota across the gut in people with CFS following a standardized exercise challenge. You can imagine that exercise may cause the gut to become leaky, allowing the bacteria that normally should be in the gut and stay in the gut to get across the gut and into the blood, causing an uh, an activated systemic immune response or inflammation. And this would be manifest in symptoms such as fatigue. Again, inflammation is associated with fatigue, with diarrhea, and with an ongoing low-grade inflammation. So this is, this is the paradigm that they are testing. This study has just gone through a number of different types of institutional reviews, and they are just starting to enroll. What they will do is they will enroll CFS patients and controls, take blood samples and stool samples to get a handle on what that microbial gut community is doing from both cases and controls. And then this, this will be another exercise challenge study. So blood and stool will be taken before exercise on all subjects, and then an hour after, 48 hours after, 72 hours after. The samples will be analyzed for the various types of microbial communities that are present, in addition to looking at a number of different cytokines that are activated in the blood, compare those between the cases and controls. And they are working um, uh, with the lights in Utah and Ilising to also have these samples examined for uh, XMRV to see whether or not XMRV is activated using this challenge. And again, this, start, this study has just started, but um, it, it, it's also very exciting because we now know that there are a number of chronic diseases that where the the gut, the intestinal microbiota is altered. There's a different balance, and there is an escape of the microbes across the gut, causing this inflammation. 
and this is a this is a nice target for intervention. There are the natural ways to intervene using probiotics, for example, and there's other targeted ways to uh, to get at. Um, these differences in the microbial communities, if this is the case in CFS. So we're wrapping up here. And I think it's, it's um, fair to ask, have we been able to zoom in on anything? Given that picture in the background, again, we're studying many of these systems in these research studies that we um, support. Have we gotten closer to a target or a set of targets that we can focus on? One of the ways that we're helping um, ourselves define these targets, refine these targets, and zoom in is um, with the computer science group, the bioinformatics group at NYU, led by Bud Mishra, again, at the New York University School of Medicine. And he's working with Eric Aslaxon, who's also at NYU, in collaboration with all of the investigators in order to take the information that they generate in addition to the, to the information that's already out there in the world to help figure out what is actually causing CFS and how can we zoom in on specific targets. Let me give you a little bit of background on how um, this is a, a, a really kind of computer geeky project, but it's perhaps one of the, the most important to our current research support because it has the potential to bring together all of the information that we have in order to help us identify and refine and zoom in on some of the most promising biomarkers. So let's look, look at this diagram. <clears throat> what this shows is journals. These are two different types of journals. Cell is a very, very cool journal. PNAS, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. These are just, just journals. And what, what Bud and his team are doing is they are retrieving all relevant information from the scientific and medical literature and they're creating a library. So this is a specialized knowledge base or database for CFS, which they will then convert it into such a, a format that they can then mine it using particular types of information retrieval methods. So in other words, if we wanted to ask a question about all of the um, genes that are involved with a type of immune response, we could query it or we can mine it in that manner. <clears throat> and we then get specific types of patterns from that information. And this is all stored and curated in various types of databases and warehouses, which then become the, 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 the base, the, the library, for asking specific targeted questions about CFS and also for looking for specific types of patterns. And now I'm going to show you a simulated output of that process. So what they have done is they've gathered the literature on the domains that are affected in people with CFS, the brain, the blood, the gut. Each one of these little dots represents a piece of information, whether that be information from the literature or whether that be information from the experiments that have been conducted by our investigators. These, similar to what you saw in Gordon's um, in, in Gordon's research, these are networks. These are how these bits of information communicate or are related to one another. So we have a bunch of related information from the brain, 
um, some from the blood, much more highly um, associated with one another. And you can see over here, this is less related, for example, again, in the, in the gut. But what we really want to know is how are these things related to each other? What is it in this information that can be tied or linked to possibly causing CFS or the, the, simp the, the symptom or the, the, um, the sign that we are, we are studying? And in this simulated example, we see that there's one thing that is common or ties these three domains together. And for example, we can say, we could speculate, well, this is XMRV, for example, or this is EBV. This is a simulated example, guys. This isn't something that's real. But this is the, this is the type of result that we hope to have um, available to us in the near future with this project. OK, I'm going to wrap up with um, a few more slides. Suzanne, can we yeah. do one poll? Um, been getting a lot of questions from people about their interest in like super uh, impressively astute questions about each of the individual studies that obviously we can't uh, get into. But we're really interested to hear from all of you guys about which of these studies you'd like us to go into more detail about, both in our webinars and in our um, monthly CFIDS link and the uh, Solve CFS print publication that we put out. So if you can, um, is that poll coming up for everybody? Gosh, what's going on? Organizer must close poll to okay. resume screen sharing. Hmm. Here we go. OK, people are voting now. Um, so let us know which, which of these studies you're most interested in, and no fair voting for every single one. <laughs> um, and we will do our best to um, get that information out. I know um, if we have a few minutes, we'll go back. And I've tried to answer questions, um, typing away here as Suzanne's been talking about um, just clarification or how to participate in different studies. but. Um, Hopefully, we'll have time before our webinar cuts off at 3.30 um, to answer, for you to answer some of those questions as well. OK, we're almost up to 80%. Everybody could just take a second and click, click. That'll be very helpful information for us. Suzanne, can you just, um, while we're doing that, talk a little bit about the network? and how each of the six investigators are working together with you as their um, fearless leader and coordinator to make even more of this data than they would um, be able to do if they were only working independently. So um, it just happens that these six studies um, cover a a, a different aspect or a different part of CFS and how we're trying to um, understand it. So it, it, it made sense that in order to be able to um, recapitulate a, a, a CFS system, that these six investigators would be most effective if if kind of brought together and coordinated together and worked together in order to be able to really understand what the other investigators were doing and how that might impact their research and vice versa. And in fact, it's, it's been phenomenal. So right now, we have um, all the investigators collecting samples <clears throat> So not only for their own study, but so that their samples or these samples can be tested um, using the biomarkers or against the biomarkers that the other investigators have identified, for example. And, and not only the biomarkers that they identify, 
but possibly other ones, such as XMRV. And I think I, sh I showed you that three of the investigators are testing for XMRV. So the fact that we're, um, the investigators are working in a coordinated network, talking to each other, learning from each other, I think has just been a tremendous um, benefit and, and very welcomed by everyone because it, it, it really, it really um, increases the value of their research um, as, as well as helps us accelerate the rate at which, at which we, can, we can, again, move these biomarkers from the bench to the bedside, from the bench to the true impact, and that's to help in objective diagnosis and treatment. Do you want to have, add anything else to that, Kim? No, just that um, many people have written in, as you've been speaking, about what each of these studies means in terms of clinical care and how their doctors will get this information. Um, there's no direct path to that. All of these studies are in process. A couple of them have had publications, and we've uh, tried to get that information out as each of these investigators has individually published data. But it's really the power of this network that is going to help harness the incredible work being done in each of these laboratories and clinics um, to make scientific consensus come together over what that bullseye target is for CFS and how to make uh, rapid acceleration of improved diagnostics and treatments. And that's what our whole research program is about. So I think what makes our program unique is bringing all of these people together and Marvin and Dicoma being able to study the same patients and information that Kathy is gaining in her lab then being shared with Gordon pre publication so that he can factor those um, markers into his studies, and then all of the data being shared with Bud Mishra as he does his computational work. I mean, that's just not the typical way, the traditional way that science proceeds. Everybody kind of works in their own silos, and then it gets um, published a year and a half later or two years later, and then people learn that way. So we're trying to really concentrate the effort of all of these really talented um, smart people so that the, the learning comes as we all learn together and as they all benefit from the different perspectives and disciplines that each one of them brings to the study of this very complicated disease. Um, That's right. And I think one other important thing to say is that in no way has this coordinated collaborative research affected any one investigator's competitive advantage, either to publish or to to take you know the biomarkers to the next stage or to get further funding. As a matter of fact, I think it's 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 enriched their competitive edge because they have more information for which to move forward on. And and I think the other thing that that is just really remarkable is how um, the, the the collaborative opportunities it's opened up between the investigators and beyond. In September, we held a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor to expand to see if investigators were interested in joining us and expanding the research network. And there was overwhelming support for that to occur. So we're working towards getting funding in order to be able to really expand the, the network and so that we can get this information to where it needs to be, and that is in the clinic, at the doctors, um, much faster than without some type of coordinated effort. OK. Um, so I'm going to finish up. And I want to once again emphasize that we need validated biomarkers in order to be able to shorten the time between a diagnosis of CFS to effective treatment and intervention. And I put this, this model or this schematic together when, when I was at 
CDC working on biomarkers myself. And I, you know, I think we understand that the population of people affected with CFS is large and it's heterogeneous. But we can identify that. We can screen for that type of, of, of state, chronic fatigue syndrome state. And then we can classify using various types of biomarkers and information, again, both self-report information and some of the laboratory information, like what Gordon's doing, to, to, to begin to sort out this, this mixed bag of, of diseases into various groups and subgroups, even further refined based on some of the molecular biomarkers that are now being identified. For example, you can, you can imagine back here in this CFS group that, and we see three different types of CFS, and that's probably a minimum. Let's say the red folks are those that are XMRV positive, for example. Let's say the brown folks are those that are, are um, black mold triggered CFS, and let's say these are, are um, traumatic brain injury CFS. So all fall under that umbrella of CFS, but each having different either triggers or causes or biomarkers of CFS. These can be further refined or di dissected out using um, uh, biomarkers that we identify that are relevant to those groups. Which, can, which will then allow us to, to really target the types of interventions that would be most effective for that subgroup. You can imagine that throwing one drug at a very, um, a, a very kind of heterogeneous mixture of, of, of people will be much less effective than if you're able to get a very homogeneous or like disease group to treat. So this is the, the paradigm that we aim for, that we are, that we are aiming to, to decrease the amount of time that it gets, that it takes to get a diagnosis to effective treatment. Not 15 years, not 20 years, it's going to be a much truncated, much more effective um, approach. And how can we help get there? One of the things, another new initiative that we have started is a biobank. And right now we're calling this our Solve CFS Biobank. And we really see this as your opportunity part to participate in research and our opportunity to really be a resource for the research community. So how does a biobank work? Well, it's essentially a bank. And it's a bank of, of samples that are collected from the CFS patient community. And um, in, in our case, we're going to um, make sure that our bank has, has extremely well characterized CFS patients that have a CFS diagnosis. And along with the various types of biological samples that you will um, submit to the bank, we will also be collecting um, extensive clinical information in addition to your documented diagnosis. This information, both sample and clinical, is stored in a very secure um, bank, which can then be um, used or accessed actually only by us and researchers and people that have the, the capability of examining the, the, um, the biological samples for biomarkers, for example, request access to, to the bank and then once the various applications for access are reviewed, then these samples are released. So I think you can see that the biobank is also an incredible tool, an incredible 
resource for truncating that time that it takes to validate the markers that we need in order to be able to understand how to get much more targeted treatment. One of the things that we hear time and time again from investigators is that it's so hard to find um, patients to participate or you know, there's a study going on in one part of the country and you're in another part of the country. This biobank gives us the, the capability of collecting samples from literally around the world, storing them in one place, and letting those be a resource which the CFS research community can tap into. Not only is it convenient, but it's much more cost effective. You can imagine that um, taking this responsibility of identifying patients and collecting and storing all of this information off of the, um, the shoulders of the investigator um, is, is just much, is, is a great value um, to, to the community and of course to the research world in general. We will um, be launching this in the next couple of weeks or so, so please stay tuned for more information on, on how you can become part of the solution. Um, and, and be one in our Solve CFS Biobank. So I'd like to thank everyone for your time. It looks like we didn't lose too many people over this hour, hour plus um, webinar. It's been great fun, although it is somewhat nerve-wracking to be kind of talking to myself um, at the, <laughs> looking at the screen. I, I hope I did this incredible research of our researchers justice um, and maybe in the near future they will be able to share with you using this type of communication approach um, yeah and give you more updated and exciting information thank you once again for your time and I think Kim you want to close up right yep can you switch controls back to me um, and one question that has come up, and I'm happy to um, answer it, is who is funding all this research? <laughs> and oh, yes. If you guys, um, through your gifts and generous donations to the CFIS Association of America, um, we did in, 19, in 2007 and 2008 um, a targeted research campaign, and we were able to raise a million dollars um, in order to be able to make these commitments. And our board has the very strict policy that we don't make commitments, we don't have money to fulfill. So before we can make any additional research commitments to extend either these findings or the research um, that is going on in other labs and in other countries, um, we will be um, asking again for the community's support um, unfortunately, we well understand the financial difficulties that CFS often um, brings with it, and it is um, one of our um, priorities to try to shift the funding burden from the patient population to other sources, and that's what our public policy work on Capitol Hill is about. But until that time, um, it, it's just tremendous to have the support of the community behind us and um, the enthusiasm that's come through very loud and clear in terms of your questions about our, our program. So um, to answer those questions about who funds this, this is the CFIDS Association of America's research program that is um, entirely made possible through um, donations by individuals, most of whom have uh, been affected either themselves or through a close family member or a close friend. So that's, uh, that's where the money comes from. Um, also for the biobank as well. That was another question. Um, a few other questions that have come through, and I'm not sure what you guys are seeing. My screen is kind of uh, jumbled up at the moment. Suzanne, what do you see on your screen? You're the only one I can hear from. <coughs> um, I see you. You know, your, your, your thing came up. Um, 
right now it's just uh, the launch screen. Okay. Um, we are going to be um, doing these webinars. Um, we just had a great response both in terms of participation and people's interest in, in other topics and a lot of the questions that have come through today um, really beg for additional depth and detail into each of the areas that the researchers are studying. Hey, Kim, so can, you, have, can you minimize? Um, yeah, just I'm try minimizing trying. that. I don't know why that won't go away. Maybe if you put it on um, screen or, uh, yeah, slideshow. A little sorry, bit I'm sorry to interrupt. Guys. No, no, no. Um, sorry for this technical problem. Luckily, it came in at the end and not at the beginning. Um, but we have um, kind of set aside the third Thursday of every month to bring you different webinar topics that we can plan in advance and then uh, to supplement those with topics that might come up on a more um, urgent or news-breaking basis. Uh, for instance, if, if one of these investigators has a publication, we can get them to come on and, and share with you some of the details of that publication. We know there's a tremendous amount of interest in XMRV research, and Suzanne serves on one of the federal committees that's looking into the blood supply safety issues, and I serve on another of the uh, federal committees that is examining those topics, and um, we know that that is uh, continues to be a, a topic of great interest, particularly in light of studies like the one that was published on Monday. And if you haven't seen Suzanne's analysis of the latest XMRV um, study, please check uh, the homepage of our website has links to that and to all the other XMRV resources. Um, are you still seeing like a big block in the middle of my screen? Yep. Yeah, I can't get rid of it. Um, it seems to have locked up here. There are actually lots of questions about Epstein-Barr virus, the biobank, Sjogren's, um, different measures in the light study, different things that Dr. Shukla is looking for, um, post-exertional relapse and whether exercise is a good idea. Um, all of your questions that we didn't get to today, and we apologize for that, um, just so much to cover. And this research is, is so rich um, in terms of all of the different points it's trying to address that Suzanne had a tall order cut out for her today to go through six studies. Um, but your questions, if you, they weren't answered, give us tremendous food for the next uh, program and, and through this series, and we hope you'll join us for each one. Um, as she said, the biobank information will be rolling out, um, and we know that that's uh, participating in research is something that's very important to many people in the community. Um, also, Dr. Meadow and Dr. Shungu are actively recruiting patients for their studies. Um, there are links to that on our website, and we'll put something up on the home page to direct you more easily to that information. And we'll also and Shukla, too. Uh, Sanjay uh, Shukla sure. in Marshfield. Unfortunately, for each of those studies, you have to be able to go to the center. Obviously, it's hard to put you through um, the MRS machine, that big tube that Suzanne <laughs> showed you, if you're not present. So that's not a study that can be done remotely. Um, Suzanne, several questions from people in uh, outside the US who wanted to know about the biobank. And I can't remember um, whether we can accept samples from outside the US or not. But that yes, we can. yes, we can. Yes, we can. So all of our international colleagues, please. Um, know that we're uh, making provisions for, for you guys as well. And family members, somebody asked about family member studies and genetic studies. Um, one of the tremendous advantages of uh, us housing this biobank is that is a, a tremendous interest of Suzanne's. And she actually finished a certification program last summer on um, genetics and uh, population genetics and the importance of family history and, and conditions that run in families. Um, there were also a lot of questions about comorbidities, and we'll try to get to those in future programs. And I think we're either going to get cut off or something <laughs> if we don't wrap up soon. 
And uh, since you can't see my last couple of slides here, I will make that information and links back to things that we talked about today um, available in the follow-up um, email. And just so much appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, it's a little odd to sit by yourself and listen to all this and watch it on screen, but I think this technology is a tremendous uh, resource for all of us to get this information out and, and bring it to life in a different way than we can through the printed word or e-newsletters or other mechanisms. Um, when you log off, you guys will get just a quick five question uh, survey that would help us again for the um, follow-up uh, to this program and also for our series. So we hope you'll take just a second to, to complete that as you exit out and um, let your brains uh, rest and relax um, after we're done. So thanks so much, Suzanne. Tremendous job. Um, miss you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll be back in touch with everybody soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.